All right, so uh, welcome everybody today to this afternoon um, uh, seminar talk by Professor Christopher Morris. Uh, I'm really delighted to see him at the University of Waterloo. And basically he's going to be telling us today about micro-scale tissue on chip technologies. And I wanted to give a few words about uh, Professor Morris, um, oh. <laughs> Chris, oh. I guess Chris background. Uh, he did his undergrad degree at the University of Toronto in engineering science, specializing in nanoengineering. And then he went on to do grad studies uh, in mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering at the University of Toronto. And then went on to do uh, postgraduate post work at, uh, in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. Uh, Biointerface Institute, and he held there a Banton postdoctoral fellowship. So it's um, it's a really a great honor to have him having a very successful researcher at uh, at our talk today. Uh, uh, Chris, pro our research program basically combines uh, biology, medicine, engineering, and really aims to recreate a microenvironment to understand development and medicine. And basically, today is going to be telling us a little bit more about this. He also has received, uh, for the work that he has done and his research, uh, some great awards, including the Ansert Award Alpert Postdoctoral Prize, as well as the yearly CIFAR Prize for Interdisciplinary Research. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, thank you. It's, it's rare that I'm in a lecture hall, and that is what happens at the beginning of the talk. Um, so thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always nice to come back to Waterloo. I used to teach here at the Shad Valley program over the summertime, and so coming back is a little bit like a homecoming for me. Uh, what I'd like to do today is talk about things that are going on in my lab. It's recently established. We started in 2014 at McGill University. Uh, and we've been investigating how the microenvironments that surrounds a cell affects the way cells function, and in turn, how we can leverage that or use that to do something interesting or cool or useful or practical. Uh, and so my Middle Earth title for today is From 2D to 3D and Back Again, because we're going to be looking at the transition from two dimensions to three dimensions and what it takes to go to jump between those, uh, uh, those dimensions. Uh, before we really get into it, though, I'd like to play this video. Every, in every scientist's life, there's something that shows up that really sticks with you. Like you look at a video or you look at a figure or there's one paper that really excites you. I've been fortunate to have three or four of those papers show up since I started uh, research. But this one has held my attention for the longest time. What you're looking at is a Drosophila embryo. So that's a fruit fly. And the fruit fly is being imaged by light sheet microscopy. Light sheet microscopy allows us to image single cells in a developing organism. And we can watch how that developing organism grows and, and, and you know, forms its structures. So you're looking at nuclei, and those nuclei are being moved around. They're being pulled all over the place. You can see some sort of structure start to emerge as, as the uh, Drosophila continues to develop. Uh, this is really quite a rapid process, but very soon you'll start to see these zones where you develop functional organs. This is a top view and a side view of that same organism. Uh, and very rapidly from nothing from a homogeneous mess of cells, you quickly produce this highly complicated structure which works, right? There's a, this, it, it works in 99.9% .9 of the time. This developmental process produces a living, you know, in this case, breathing and eating organism. Uh, and so when I look at that video, there's a few things that jump out at me. We're used to doing cell culture on flat two-dimensional dishes. That's not a flat two-dimensional situation. That's a complex three-dimensional structure where cells are moving around and being pulled into place. Uh, the second thing that jumps out at me is when I talk to developmental biologists about this video, they see signaling pathways. They see morphogenic gradients. They see differentiation. They see um, um, chemicals. They see chemistry happening. They see genes and proteins happening. Uh, I trained as a mechanical engineer, and when I look at that, I see a gigantically complicated mechanical process. Cells are grabbing onto other cells, pulling themselves around, organizing themselves into the right structure, uh, and then altering that, that, you know, the, uh, each of the organ structures itself to provide some sort of function. So for me, that is very much a mechanical process, uh, but no one really thinks about it as a mechanical process. Uh, and then finally, it's not just cells that are moving around. 
part of this dance is that cells are differentiating and rapidly becoming something else so that they get the specialized functions that they need in order for that, uh, for that tissue and then that organ and then that organism to function and survive. So you're looking at three-dimensional structures that undergo strong mechanical processes and mechanical remodeling. Uh, and at the same time, they differentiate in a spatial and a temporal pattern to provide what is needed when it's needed. For those of you who are like aficionados of manufacturing engineering and you've read those kinds of books, this is what's called just-in-time manufacturing, right? Right at the right moment, the cells do the right thing to produce what is needed. Uh, it's an incredibly versatile process, and it's an incredibly robust process. Uh, if you interfere with it a little bit, the cells can typically recover, and from that flexible manufacturing process arises something that works. And so when I look at this, I wonder, you know, if we can understand that, if we can figure out how those cells are working together to do what they are doing, well, then maybe we can design better tissues for replacement therapies or for drug discovery models or for a huge range of applications. But it requires us to understand what's going on in there, and that's not easy. Uh, the, the, I take that idea of looking at something happening, I look at this complicated process, and I reframe that idea into provocative objectives for my graduate students. Uh, and when I say provocative objectives, I mean things that infuriate the daylights out of them because it forces them to think very, very differently about the systems that they're working with. So instead of looking at things through a microscope, I ask them, well, what if we could look inside our bodies? What if we could really see what's going on inside this complicated mess of a biological, biological system and watch biophysics happen? Can we watch biophysics occur in the disease process and then be able to understand that system a little bit better? But we go a little bit better than that. Instead of just looking at the current state, what if we could look into the future? What if we could design a biological system and predict what's going to happen to it later on based on the way that it's currently behaving or acting? If you can, that gives you a much better insight into maybe diagnosis of a disease and preventative measures for that disease. Uh, and then, most cruelly of all, what if we could look into alternative realities? What if instead of looking at what's real and what's now, what if we could change it just a little bit? And if we change it, we maybe can understand it a, a, a bit better. Or understand how it's going to work when we put it into unusual situations. Uh, for example, no one knows what's, what's going to happen if we, um, you know, if we colonize space and start to live in a microgravity environment. Are organisms going to develop as they would on Earth? We don't know, but maybe we can understand if we start to explore these alternative realities, which aren't real at the moment, but might be real in the future. Uh, so we could build better microscopes to do this. Uh, I'm not a, I don't run a microscopy lab. Uh, sometimes, given the videos that I've seen, I wish I did. Uh, but we don't build better microscopes in my lab. Instead, the approach that we've taken is if we can't look at these things in the body, uh, if we can't look at them in a, in a dish, then maybe our, our way of going about it is, is to rebuild the body. If you can't see something in its actual system, let's rebuild it in a way that allows us to see it better. And if you can re see it more clearly or see it in a different way, then you get insight that you wouldn't get any, anywhere else. Now, this is my crazy idea. And then after a while, I realized it's not so crazy at all. We've been doing this for a very long time. Anytime you take a cell out of an organism right, and you culture it on a Petri dish, you are recreating that organism in a way that makes it easy to see. You've taken the cell out of its hard to image location and you've put it onto something which you can easily put into the microscope or do live imaging or watch something happen. Uh, that's been around for a long time. The trouble is that we don't really know if that's real or not. You take a cell out of the body and you put it onto a hard, flat plastic dish, well, it sees a hard, flat plastic surface. Uh, virtually nothing in the body is hard, flat, or plastic. So will that cell behave the same way? Will it behave in a realistic way? And are we really looking into what's going on in the body when we take a cell out of it and put it in a completely different context? Uh, so we focus on building better Petri dishes. If we can build a better Petri dish that looks more like the environment a cell might see or captures some of those details, uh, then perhaps we can see something that's a little bit more real. Uh, so to conceptualize this, when we think about a cell sitting inside of a tissue, it sees a lot of different things. First, it sees other cells around it. It's touching other cells. That might make a difference to the way it functions. Uh, 
then it sees the stiffness of your surroundings. If it pulls on the surroundings and the surroundings just gives like a floppy thing, uh, it might behave differently than if it was in a rigid type of environment. And it, and it does behave differently. Uh, cells in body are mostly in three-dimensional culture. The vast majority of cells are in a three-dimensional type of system. Hard, flat plastic dishes are a two-dimensional system. They also see topography differently in the body. They see solid and fluid stresses. Uh, and then on top of all of those things, they see soluble factors like signals and drugs and you know, genes and proteins and the usual method that's methods that biologists have at looking at these systems. If we can recreate the right aspects of it, if we can pick the right things to rebuild outside of the body, then we're likely to get a realistic behavior. That cell is gonna behave in a way that is relevant and that matters. Uh, if you can do that, then you can start to understand disease a little bit better, maybe engineer better tissues for replacement or for studies, uh, and develop better drug discovery models where you treat a tissue with a tentative drug or a, or a potential drug. If it does what you think it does, then there's a good chance that that'll translate over into, the human, uh, into a human context, which is not the case for hard, flat plastic dishes. Uh, so our tools to do that, and these are tools that I've developed since my graduate degrees, uh, we work with a lot of microfluidics and microfabrication. If we can build stuff on the length scale of individual cells, then we can understand it better. If we can control the surroundings of the cell on the length scales of cells, that gives us the ability to ask questions that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. We also design our own biomaterials to do a, vo a wide variety of things. Uh, we recently started this really interesting project where we try and blend synthetic materials with patient-derived clinical tissues and understand how the combination of those two things might be used to influence disease progression. Uh, and then we take microscale tissue engineering strategies and blend those all together to, to run our experiments. Those are the tools that are available. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today, though, is this, is this sort of design theme that has shown up in my lab over the last year or so. I wasn't necessarily intending to go this way, but this is what's come out of it, and I'm really quite excited about it. We're looking at the interactions between building culture environments for some practical use. We say that there's a reason to build this. We want to build a new technology that will allow us to recreate this tissue. Uh, we've been working on that aspect of it. And at the same time, we've been trying to build in technologies that will allow us to watch biology happen in high definition. And I'm using the words high definition you know, with massive air quotations on it because HD doesn't mean the same thing to different people. If we can see stuff in a biological system that we couldn't see using any other technique, I'm considering that to be HD or high definition. If we can look at the mechanics of a tissue as it's evolving, I'm considering that to be a high definition image because you can't see that any, any other way. And so we've been working at, on the interaction between these two things, a design cycle between them. And so what I'd like to do today is to talk about three projects that feed into that design cycle. We'd start off with a new technique to engineer microscale three-dimensional tissues in a dish, and I think that that technique is re more realistic and faster. Uh, and then on the integrative technology side, I'm gonna talk about a new system that we've developed to watch mechanics happen in a living, evolving tissue. And finally, I'd like to take that knowledge, the scientific um, understanding that we've developed through those processes, and use it to build mechano-inspired tissues, or manufacture those tissues for a couple of applications, including drug screening uh, and cell therapeutic replacement tissue engineering. Uh, but first, very quickly, we look uh, at how we engineer microscale three-dimensional tissues. There's a bunch of different techniques that are available to do this. My lab has developed three or four of them ourselves. I'm gonna talk about the newest one. Uh, this is work that came out of my postdoctoral lab and they were building these hanging drop plates. Hanging drop plates are a very old technique to make three-dimensional tissues. You take a bunch of cells, you put them into a little hanging droplet of liquid. The cells don't have anything else to grab onto, so they grab onto each other, right? That's the only thing that's available to them. They grab onto each other and they form this nice tight, this tight cell aggregate. And if you let that grow up a little bit more, it's considered a spheroid. A spheroid is often used as a drug discovery model, especially for cancer screening, because those look a lot like cancer tumors. And you can treat it with a chemotherapeutic and see how it responds. Uh, 
this is what these images look like if you're watching this happen. Uh, and the innovation that my postdoctoral lab had been working on was making this high throughput. They figured out how to build this in a plastic plate that integrated with a robotic pipetta. And the robotic pipetta would come in and dispense these single cells or, or groups of cells into the wells. Uh, and you'd achieve this hanging drop culture, presumably in high throughput. Uh, that's what we said to the news agencies. In practice, actually using that system is a nightmare. Uh, the reason is handling. If you look at the pipetting process here, the cells are going to be consuming media in this tiny droplet of liquid. As the cells consume media, you need to replenish that media somehow. To replenish the media, I had to go in with the pipette, suck out half the liquid, disp dispose of it, and replace half the liquid with fresh media. You had to do that three or four times for each of those wells before you were able to replace the full media component. Every single time you pipette it, you risk losing that little tissue that's sitting in that well. Every time you suck up, the, pipe, the, the tissue could be aspirated into the pipette system and lost. It's gone from your experiment. Uh, which means that if you start out with a 96 well plate, by the end of a two-week or three-week culture cycle, you're usually down to about 10 of these tissues that you can study with which is super awkward, but it works great in the initial steps. In the beginning, this is a fantastic process, but handling is evil. Throughput is also a problem then. If you're losing these samples as you, move through, as you work through your culture growth, uh, it, it, you, you, can't, you can't lose 90% of your samples and still get, a, get away with it. Next, if you're interested in studying the life cycle of these systems, if you're interested in treating it with a drug and then fixing it and then staining it and then doing multiple antibody washes and secondary labels. We're talking about 15 media transfers just to get that done. 15 media transfers times four is 60. You're going to lose a ton of samples right towards the end of that process. Uh, and there's no real way to control tissue shape. You always only end up with these spherical structures. And so uh, Lisa Zhao, a master's student in my lab, pretty much came up with this thing on her own. Um, she developed the spheroid production and life cycle analysis template, which unfortunately the acron acronym is just SPLAT, which is a sort of <laughs> awkward name for a culture system. But our SPLAT system is a three-dimensional microprinted plate. And if you, if you imagine this microprinted plate, it looks like a bunch of golf balls sitting on the lawn. And the golf balls are all laid out on the lawn in front of you. And it's 3D printed, so we get these nice curved structures. Lisa was able to replicate those structures in a polyacrylamide hydrogel. Uh, so polyacrylamide hydrogels are the same things that people use for Western blotting. Instead of putting the combs into the hydrogel as it's gelling, we put our little 3D printed mold into the hydrogel. Once it gels, you pull the 3D printed mold out, and you're left with these little pockets. And the cool thing about the pockets is that single cells can go into the pockets, but once they grab onto each other, well, they can't come out again. Right? That opening is too small for them to come out. So they all aggregate on the inside. We build these nice, dense cultures. And then you can shake it. You can wash it. You can fluorescently image it. You can do all of that stuff directly on chip without losing your samples. Uh, we get a pretty decent amount of throughput out of this. On one of those, uh, this is an 18 millimeter diameter cover slip. And we have about 200 um, individual spheroids on that, on that culture chip. Uh, all of them survive the process, which never ever happens in real life, but I seem to be living in a fantasy lab where things work out. Uh, we're able to stain directly on that chip and do our drug screening experiments on that chip. Uh, and we're realizing now that we can start to do impossible cultures, cultures which couldn't be done using the regular hanging drop technique or other spheroid making methods. Uh, depending on the cell type, things behave very differently. You never get these really nice, tight, circular structures. We're finding that for the three different cancer cell lines that we tried, even though they don't work with other techniques, they do work with this one. And I suspect it's because the cells don't have a choice. Right? We're forcing them into this tight space. They're receiving plenty of nutrients through the hydrogel matrix that surrounds it. Uh, and they seem to be growing up great. Uh, and now, eventually, now that we've got this technique down, I'm hoping that instead of just printing golf balls in our 3D printed template, we can print much more complicated structures and let spheroids or mini organoids grow into this complicated structure and be shaped by the matrix for, uh, for expansion. Uh, so next, next steps, we'll work on engineered shapes. But what this gives us the ability to do is to produce a large number of these engineered tissues, uh, very cheap and very easy. Uh, We've also discovered that three dimensions is completely different from two dimensions in terms of the way that those cells function. 
If this is a cell in 2D, we're now putting it into a three-dimensional like system where it's surrounded by a lot of cells. There's lots of things that are changing. First, the adhesive sites that are available to the cell is completely different. Instead of having um, adhesive sites only on the underside of the cell, you now have adhesive sites everywhere around the cell itself. That changes the polarity of proteins on the membrane, which changes the way, the way that they function. And that's connected to adhesion architecture. You've gone from a different uh, uh, quantity of adhesion sites to different spatial locations of those adhesion sites, and that changes stuff as well. Uh, we've shown that in most three-dimensional systems, species transport is limited. It's tough to feed things in 3D, especially if you have a big, uh, a big tissue. You can't keep the whole thing alive because it takes a lot of time for things to diffuse through that tissue. That's why we have vasculature. The vasculature transports those nutrients deep into our three-dimensional tissues. It's very difficult to build on a chip. Uh, environmental mechanics are completely different. Uh, formation of gradients or spatial gradients are being produced in three-dimensional tissues virtually automatically. None of that stuff happens in 2D. And to give you a sense as to how important that is, we've been building these screening platforms where we can look at drug discovery in three-dimensional systems. That's our pipetting assistant, which does high-throughput pla uh, high plating in, uh, in our cultures. And we're looking at cancer cells and seeing how those cancer cells respond to chemotherapeutics. Uh, even when you control for all of these parameters, adhesive sites, species transport, environmental mechanics, you, you keep all of those things consistent. As soon as you go from two dimensions to three dimensions, there's this big resistive effect where cancer cells now resist the effects of, in this case, paclitaxel. We've shown it for doxorubicin, for uh, dexamethasone, for all, all of the, not all, for three of the existing cancer therapeutics. Um, and so just by going to 3D, we see these very realistic changes to the way cells function. Uh, and that led us to ask, well, you know, what else can we study about these three-dimensional systems? Or how else can we look at it to gain more insight into what's going on inside this three-dimensional culture? Uh, so remember I mentioned mechanics right in the beginning, thinking about mechanics of that tissue as it's moving around? I wanted to know whether mechanics are different in a three-dimensional culture system. The standard method to do that analysis, to figure out what forces are being generated by a cell, is something called traction force microscopy. In traction force microscopy, a whole lot of fluorescent beads are scattered within a three-dimensional matrix. Uh, as the cell pulls, the beads move, and you can track the movement of those beads. Uh, typically, what happens is you put it under the microscope, do a confocal imaging scan on, this, uh, on your three-dimensional culture, position all the beads, and then you kill the cell, so the cell lets go of the matrix, and those beads spring back to their original position. Once it springs back to the original position, you can get a displacement. And here's the kicker. If you know the mechanical properties of the tissue, then you can figure out what forces were applied. Right? If you know the mechanical properties, if you know the deformation, you can calculate force because stress is equal to modulus times strain. Uh, so in these culture systems, if you know the mechanics, you're golden. You can figure out what the forces being generated by cells are. Uh, Nick and Avital in my lab tried to make this a little bit simpler. We developed a simpler culture platform to look at cells in 3D. This is a computationally challenge. This is a computational nightmare. It takes about a day to run this because you're looking at a thousand beads that are surrounding a small cell, which is about 20 microns, and you're trying to match those beads to other beads uh, uh, that have been displaced. So it's a challenging mathematical problem. We built a simple system where we took a hydrogel with beads on one plane, put cells on top of that, and then sandwiched that on the top with another hydrogel so that cells see a three-dimensional architecture or three-dimensional adhesions. Uh, we can then calculate traction forces. And in this simple experiment, we looked at traction force microscopy in normal cells and compared that with fibrotic cells. The results were pretty shocking. Normal cells and fibrotic cells in 2D show the fibrotic cells push pulling harder. This is expected and has been seen before in the literature many times. Uh, but when you switch over to the three-dimensional system, it completely switches. Uh, I have no idea why this happens, right? I don't understand why, how fibrotic cells, which are typically mechanically active and stiff in the matrix and are known to pull, in 3D, they don't seem to pull as hard as their normal counterparts. So I don't understand what's going on here, but it's clear that there's a difference between two dimensions and three dimensions in terms of how the cell behaves. Um, this system is useful for some of these studies, but there's severe limitations to it. First, you're stuck with a linear elastic material as your hydrogel matrix. If it's not linear elastic, you can't calculate forces. 
you're also relatively limited to small displacements. You needed to move only a little bit in order to see something happen. And if you remember back to that video in the beginning, cells are moving everywhere. They're transitioning from one end of that developmental organism to another. There's massive large-scale remodeling, and there is no way that that material is a linear elastic material. Uh, real materials don't behave like that. That material would be a viscoelastic plastic type of material, and you can't calculate forces that way. Uh, so those are the challenges with understanding forces in a three-dimensional matrix when that three-dimensional tissue is a real three-dimensional tissue. And furthermore, what does a cell see? What is it, like, does a cell see the movement of a bead and, and that's enough to characterize what the, uh, what the cell environment is? Or not, does it see something more integrative? Does it look at what's going on everywhere around the cell? Uh, so it's very difficult to use those fine techniques in a real system. And so Wante Lee, a PhD student in my lab, has been asking for, for three years now, she's been asking, how might we measure local cellular scale multidirectional forces inside a living tissue? Uh, and this is very challenging because you don't know the mechanics of that tissue be beforehand. So uh, we're moving into the second part of the talk where I'm looking at new technologies to watch mechanics happen in a living three-dimensional tissue. Uh, the strategy that's one, that Wante has taken is she's started to look at soft, compressible hydrogel spheres. Uh, these are essentially balls of hydrogel. It's liquid on the inside with a little matrix. If you squeeze them, the liquid rushes out and the whole thing changes shape. Uh, these have well-defined mechanical properties. We're once again using polyacrylamide, which is very easily tunable in terms of its mechanical uh, rigidity. We've also, uh, and then if you apply a force to these little beads, they change shape. If you apply more force to the little beads, they change shape more. If you apply funky forces to the beads, they change in a funky way. And if you can look at the shape of that, funky, of, of that funky bead, you can figure out what the forces were that caused that shape change in the first place. So we're essentially looking at a deformation, and we know the mechanical properties of that bead. If we know the mechanical properties of the bead, we know the forces that were generated at that site. And if you make these small enough and then scatter them within a tissue, you can start to watch forces evolve and develop within your three-dimensional structure. Uh, so once again, this works regardless of what the material properties surrounding that bead uh, are. Um, if, it's, you know, if it's viscoelastic or plastic, it doesn't matter. We're only looking at forces that surround that individual hydrogel bead in the inside. So you watch it, you fit it into a finite element model. From a finite element model, you can back out what forces are at that location. Uh, Erica has been building this system to allow us to make the little droplets in a size that is similar to an individual cell. So I'm not sure if you can see that clearly, but that's a microfluidic droplet generation platform. There is a oil layer that's coming in from the outside and a hydrogel liquid layer in the center. And the hydrogel liquid layer pinches off into little droplets, and those droplets are fairly well, well controlled in terms of size. We can produce a large number of these about the size of individual cells. Uh, they can be fluorescently labeled, and if you tune the hydrogel properties going in, you can get systems that are about 100 pascals in stiffness or smaller. We found 100 pascals in stiffness to work for us. Um, if you can conceptualize 100 pascals in your head, if you have a sense as to what that is, I, I take my hat off to you. It is way softer than jello. It is softer than the elastic component of mucus. If you you know, you, 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 you blow your nose, with the stuff that comes out of it, there's a viscous deformation and there's elastic deformation. The elastic deformation is on the order of our beads. And so small forces tend to change the shape of the bead a lot, and we can back out what those forces are at that location. Uh, so as a first demonstration, we took our little beads and put them into the spheroids that I've been talk uh, talking about, so an engineered fibroblast spheroid. Beads that are in the center, they tend to look fairly spherical. Beads that are towards the outside, they start to change shape, and beads that are on the very edge are very, very different in shape. Uh, and this, this, this was honestly a little bit surprising when we saw it. We then quantified all of this information that was coming out of our high throughput platforms and looked at what the uh, forces were at different locations in a spheroid. If you put all of that data together, you can look at forces in the radial direction along the spheroid. So this is forces from the center towards the outside all forces in the circumferential direction, which is forces along the walls of that spheroid. Uh, and you can plot them out, and on this graph, uh, the x equals zero line, that's the edge, and then as you move away from the edge, you're going deeper and deeper into the spheroid. Uh, 
it's tough to see what's going on from this image, so we created this autistic representation of the three-dimensional tissue. Uh, and let's take a look at these components. On the top, you've got radial stresses. On the middle, you've got, uh, in the bottom, you've got circumferential stresses. Red is tension, blue is compression. If you look on the inside region of that spheroid, not much is going on. In the inside region, there's very few forces there. We have some theories as to why that's the case, and now I'm reasonably convinced that it's because the inside is less dense than the outside. There's lots of spaces between cells on the inside. Uh, as you move a little bit further out, so now we're moving from the center outwards, you start to see compressive stresses build up in the radial and circumferential direction. These cells are growing. They're, they're, they're living, they're dividing, and they're proliferating. As they proliferate, they try and take up more space, but they're constrained by what's around them. If they try and take up more space and they can't, they have to generate compressive stresses. And then on the very edge, in the radial direction, everything's still compressive, but in the circumferential direction, you see this massive tensional component being, uh, being developed. If you imagine this, it's like a skin that's holding everything in. The insides are trying to get out, but the outside is trying, to, it's trying its best. It's under tension to collapse everything in, uh, to hold everything into its uh, spot. And this is really cool because we didn't do anything to the cells to get this to happen. We got the cells to cluster together, and then spontaneously these forces arise from within that culture. Uh, and, uh, and I think that has real implications to the way that biological systems develop. Instead of thinking about these things in terms of morph uh, morphogen gradients or soluble factors, maybe we should think about these things as individual shapes. And if we know what the shape is, the shape itself leads the cells to create their own mechanical architecture. Uh, it's, so this thin skin, we're now thinking about our spheroids or our tissues as being you know, balloons. They're being held in from the outside. Um, we then asked, well, who cares, right? Like, that's nice. Uh, scientists will find that fascinating. But why do we care what the mechanical forces are inside a spheroid? Uh, we started doing some ad hoc testings of various mechanical protein, mechanically sensitive proteins. This is the actin cytoskeleton. On the very edge, the actin cytoskeleton is substantially better developed than on the inside of your spheroids. We looked at phosphomyosin activity. Phosphomyosin is the uh, um, protein that's responsible for cells pulling or contracting the tissue. And once again, they're more active in that region of tensional stress than in the compressive regions. And then we looked at YAPTAS signaling. YAPTAS signaling is a key component in the HIPPO development pathway. It's strongly associated with a bunch of different stem cell differentiation processes. Uh, and again, we see YAPTAS activation on the outside, but not on the inside. This is not a great experiment. These are ad hoc experiments. We can't control any of these things. We're just correlating that these mechanically sensitive proteins are activating in regions where we know tension to be high or compression to be high. So it's not a good controlled experiment. Uh, then we tried to figure out, well, how can we make a good controlled experiment to set this up, to, un to, to uh, figure out whether the forces that we measure actually make a difference to biology? Uh, to do that, we had to take a completely different tack. We started to ask, when might such forces occur in vivo? Under what conditions in the body, during growth of the body, will we start to see something like this, where there's a tensional skin being developed on the outside that's holding something in and keeping a compressive mechanical profile uh, within that tissue? Uh, we looked at budding morphogenesis. Budding is something that is, uh, it occurs in uh, the development of pretty much any branch structure in the body. You're going to see this budding process. Uh, at the time, we were working with Corinne Hoesley, who is a stem cell engineer, and she's very interested in diabetes. Uh, and so she was interested in the pancreatic budding process. Uh, and in the pancreatic budding process, we start out as this amorphous structure. We start to develop the, um, uh, you know, during development. Uh, we start to develop as a tube. And then from that tube, these little buds branch out. Uh, so this is the primary gut tube. On the surface of that primary gut tube, you'll get the cells forming this little bubble. And the little bubble will grow out. It'll undergo a primary transition and then a secondary transition. But all of these processes are the same, where you start with a reasonably flat surface. And from that flat surface, a little bubble of cells pops out. Um, when, you look at it ha when you look at this process happening in the body, this is super efficient. Um, I think, if I forget the numbers now, but it's something like 99.99% of pancreases, de pancreases develop without a problem. You get this nice structure forming uh, without any challenges to that, to that process. But when we take stem cells and we try and do that in a culture dish, 
or it doesn't work that way. Right? Getting the stem cells to become pancreatic uh, cells, which you know, which sense insulin and regulate the glucose profile in the body, getting those to actually work in culture, it, it is, has, has not been easy. And people have been trying for 10 years now. Uh, so pancreatic differentiation in culture is not efficient. We were wondering if there's mechanics associated with this process, if there's mechanical forces that are being generated during this uh, uh, developmental uh, you know, cycle, uh, do those mechanics change our stem cell differentiation protocol? Ray Tran's been asking, is stem cell differentiation connected to the physical forces that are present during the organogenesis of a pancreas? Now, what we know so far is that on a three-dimensional tissue, you've got this ring of high tension. In a flat plane, the tension is fairly low. So for this budding process to happen, for a, something to arise out of the structure, there has to be a tensional component that's being created, and that tensional component springs outwards and creates a fairly complicated uh, mechanical profile. Uh, we wondered if we could take that mechanical profile and use that to improve our ability to manufacture these tissues. Ray started out from, from the ground up. He had to work with a system that simulated this organogenesis um, um, uh, pathway. And so he took induced pluripotent stem cells as his source material, went through several differentiation steps and culture protocols. Uh, these are established in the literature. We had to do our due diligence and measure all of the, uh, all of the uh, um, do PCR and measure the gene expression to get them to the stage of posterior foregut. This is similar to the gut tube that I had talked about. Uh, there's also published protocols to go from the gut tube to the pancreatic endoderm. And we found that our success rates from here to here are very low. There are about 20% success rates in getting a cell to become a pancreatic cell from the posterior foregut stage. Uh, and so Ray, again, start, started looking at his culture. And he noticed that where the cells were differentiating, where you were getting strong pancreatic development, the cells were taking on this bud-like structure. So bud-like structures were forming even in 2D, uh, and these were the only locations where you were seeing this expression of uh, pancreatic markers. And in our case, we use PDX1 as the, as the primary pancreatic marker, NKX6.1 as the secondary. Uh, and so Ray is looking at this, and he's thinking, well, there's tensional gradients that must be arising, because you start out with something flat, it's becoming a three-dimensional thing with a skin around it. If that skin is there, if that skin arises, there must be some weird mechanically dynamic tensional process being created. And so to conceptualize it, he took this picture of a bud and then tried to slice it in his head. Uh, and if you slice the top part of that bud, you can get a circular pattern. Uh, if you slice it sideways, you get this complicated wavy type of structure. And by recreating these shapes, we aim to recreate the mechanics that are going on on the tip of that bud or along the walls of the bud. Uh, to recreate the shapes, to, to make actual cultures that look like pancreatic buds as they're growing, uh, Ray used microfabrication techniques. So he used a pattern PDMS structure. Um, we can talk about this later if you haven't heard of it, but you can make microscale structures, replicate that in a silicone rubber. Uh, it's the same stuff that lines your bathtub, right? So it's waterproof and it's biocompatible. Uh, these features are tiny, about 100 microns in size, uh, and that's about the size of a human hair. Uh, the human hair is stamped down onto a surface, and it's filled with agarose. The, re the, remaining, so the remaining open spaces are filled with agarose. Agarose is really good at resisting cell attachment. And then you remove the PDMS stamp, and you're left with these little patterns into which you can seed cells. And if you seed cells, the cells will sit in the pattern. Uh, and what you're looking at here is an is a immunostain for, flora for actin. Actin is that mechanical cable that surrounds the cell, uh, that, uh, that is formed within the cell structure. And that actin cable is uh, uh, it's generally along the outside in these cases. We're tuning the way the mechanical actin cable forms by controlling the initial shape of the culture. It's like taking a snapshot of the pancreas or undergoing organogenesis. And during that snapshot, we say, this is the situation. We're recreating that mechanical situation here. We have to do a bunch of finite element modeling in order to understand this better. But the short story is that as you go smaller and smaller, you generate steeper and steeper tensional gradients in your microscale cultures. Uh, we then put our IPS cells down on that surface and started looking at the PDX1 expression marker to see if we could drive cells further down the pancreatic lineage. Uh, and we see tremendous expression, like really, really high intensities of that PDX1 stain 
when cells are cultured in those circles. Uh, in contrast, on a flat two-dimensional plate, not a lot happens. You don't see too much of that, uh, uh, of that PDX1 expression. Uh, quantifying that, we looked at structures of different sizes. These are 150 micron wells going down to 300 and then 500. Uh, and 500 is very similar to our control where we don't have micro pattern structures. Uh, so clearly something cool is going on below 500. And it just so happens that 150 microns is the size of the pancreatic bud during development. So during this development process, the size of it is controlling mechanical tension, which is then further driving expression of stem cells within that system. Uh, we've done this in circular cultures. We've also done this with uh, the wavy cultures. And in this case, looking at um, um, histograms of PDX1 expression and histograms of NKX6.1 expression. And consistently in regions of high tension, you get the uh, PDX1 expression. Uh, sorry, in, in between regions of high tension and low tension, you get uh, um, increased expression of these markers. So the mechanical environment really is connected to the way that these stem cells differentiate. We further proved that by knocking out rock, which is a strong regulator of, of mechanobiology, my, mechanobiological processes. Uh, and it's, once you knock it out, you don't see that effect anymore. So mechanics is driving something in this process. Uh, we then tried to figure out whether this was a, a really consistent thing. And to do that, we looked at a whole bunch of different samples at times that are a little bit less than the full differentiation. Here I showed you data from three days of culture. Here we're looking at data after two days. And you see there's a pattern of differentiation. Some of them are really brightly lit up, some of them are not. And we asked if this was just a statistical variation or not. Uh, to figure that out, we looked at all of our patterns at days one, day two, and day three, and classified them to either have actin being uniformly distributed throughout, uh, peaked in the middle, peaked on the edges, or um, uh, peaked right in the center of your culture. Right? So we, we classified our cultures like this. And then we quantified the fractions of our, uh, of our cultures as they went from one stage to another. And in the beginning, all of the actin cytoskeletal structures looked like this, where you've got reasonably high tension levels, but they're fairly uniform throughout your surface. On the second day, you see more of this uh, actin tension being pulled in along the outside. You see more actin filaments on the outside that start to pull in. Uh, and then by day three, those are reduced and uh, you get more expression of the actin filament on the inside. That's correlated with PDX1 expression. So as that process happens, PDX1 expression continues to go up. So the ones that have this profile have a very high percentage of PDX1 expression. They're becoming more pancreatic-like. Uh, so the picture that's coming out of this is that what we're doing is mechanically priming the tissues by putting them in a micro pattern region. There's a cable that's surrounding, on the, there's the actin cable that's being generated on the outside. The actin cable is now contracting, it's pulling the tissue together. As it's pulling the tissue together, the tissue is ir, like bubbling up a little bit and we can measure that on our confocal microscope. Uh, and then, as a result of that purse string, um, you know, I don't know if anyone uses purse strings anymore. There used to be bags with a rope around it. Maybe if you've got an old pair of sweatpants, they work that way. Uh, the bag with the rope around it, if you want to tighten the bag, you pull on the rope. Same thing is going on here. You've got a rope on the outside of actin, and the rope is pulling together, and the rope is essentially bulging out your little culture. Uh, and once purse string morphogenesis happens, you get high levels of pancreatic differentiation. Uh, but, is that morphogenesis step really important? Do I need to go through all of this? What if I just created a system which looked like this in the first place? Would I get better pancreatic differentiation? Ray nearly ate me alive when I asked him this question because this was, entirely, this was his entire master's thesis that I was essentially questioning. Uh, so he ran a bunch of experiments. These aren't great experiments yet. I haven't figured out how to do this experiment right. But we took cells that, that prior to them differentiating and tried to make three-dimensional spheroids out of them using the technique, that I did, the, the splat method that I talked about before. In all cases, we could not keep those cells alive. If you take the cells and you force them to pack into a three-dimensional structure, they don't stay alive, and because they're dead, they don't differentiate. Um, so it looks like you need to have this morphogenetic component force the cells into the shape that they want, and that gives you the right uh, um, stem cell differentiation markers. This suggests that cell mechanodynamics are really important for tissue engineering. If you look up mechanodynamics, you won't find anything because I made that up. Um, 
I'm trying to understand how this system works and, and having to incorporate dynamic mechanical forces is particularly interesting and exciting based on this data. Uh, we also have other budding projects in the lab, which I don't think I'm going to spend too much time on. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the placenta. The placenta is the organ that regulates transport between the mom and the baby, or regulates development of that baby. It is one of the most understudied organs that there are. Uh, for a long time, people threw out the placenta after birth. Uh, it looks like the placenta is one of the main regulators for how healthy the baby is and how healthy the mom is over the long term, too. So we're trying to build systems to understand this a little bit better. The placenta also has these bud-like structures in it and, this, and a very specialized region of cells around the surface of that bud. If we do the same experiments again and we know the mechanical profiles to expect, put those into our cultures, you can get that stem cell differentiation profile to mirror, what, uh, to mirror the syncytiotrophoblast that's present around the placenta. And I can talk more in the, about that in detail, in detail if you're interested. But uh, the formation of that specialized cell is enhanced in microcultures. And our goal now is to use this knowledge, to use the fact that we can get cells to differentiate properly uh, to create a drug screening platform for the placenta. Uh, one of the reasons that pregnant women cannot take most drugs that are available is that we don't know how that drug is going to cross the placental barrier and get to the baby. If we can use this knowledge to create a high throughput screening platform to look at how drugs cross that placental barrier, uh, that gives us a great deal of insight into what's safe and what's not safe. Uh, but that's a project for the future. So a quick summary, I've talked about making tissues, uh, specifically using SPLAT, which is a fast, easy way to produce 3D tissues. It's high throughput, robust, and shape controlled, and I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do with that in the future. Uh, the philosophy is to watch and learn. We figured out how to look at cell-generated forces inside of three-dimensional tissues. And by looking at it, we can learn something fundamentally new about that biological system. We've also shown that complex mechanical force profiles arise in 3D culture uh, just by virtue of them being in 3D culture. Uh, and now we're leveraging that information. We're looking at budding morphogenesis as a mechanically dynamic process. We're recreating the mechanics that allow us to co-evolve stem cell differentiation, using that to try and build platforms to improve the production of beta cells for diabetes therapy, uh, or looking at using these techniques to um, uh, create better drug discovery and screening platforms. Uh, just while I, I guess because the audience is young and impressionable, I'm, I'm particularly enthusiastic about the way this research profile has developed in that I always used to be you know, very focused on engineering. I wanted to build something and you build it right and it works great, then awesome. I'm finding more and more that to be a really good engineer, you've also got to be a really good scientist. You've got to work with the people who are actually think about what's going on in this culture. And if you can understand that really well, then that allows you to do even cooler engineering later on. So my personal evolution seems to be more from engineering to scientist and clinical biologist eventually. Uh, so you'd be surprised at where life can take you as long as you find the right collaborators to work with. With that, I'd like to thank my lab. I lucked out with my lab group. They are a wonderful bunch of people to work with. Uh, the people who specifically contributed to this work are listed in bold. Uh, we wouldn't get very far without our collaborators at McGill and outside, and specifically Morag Palk, who does a lot of the three-dimensional culture work that I've talked about, and Corinne Hoysley, who is the uh, uh, pancreatic diabetes engineer, both at McGill. Uh, we also continue to work with Shu Takeyama at Michigan, Andy Putnam at Michigan, and Rogong Zhao at Sunny Buffalo, who's helped us analyze the three-dimensional forces that I've talked about so far, uh, and our funding sources. And with that, if you have any questions, I I'd be happy to take them. Do you think you could, like, scale up the... Um like the, the well plates that you had, the like 3D printed imprint well plates, do you think you could make like larger and larger spheroids if you could like supply the, the inner tissue? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was whether we could um, recreate that, uh, make the tissues bigger, use that spheroid plating technique to go bigger. Uh, we've gone, we've currently shown that we can go up to about a millimeter. Um, the cells, they go in as a millimeter and then they compact together to be about 300 or 400 microns. And they seem to survive okay with 300 or 400 microns. Anything more than that, you need some way of delivering nutrients to the system. Uh, there are a few techniques that people are exploring to do that. Uh, we have a collaborator who's building 
uh, degradable biomaterials that release oxygen as they degrade. And so if you put little pellets of these biomaterials into the culture, then you could feed them with oxygen. Uh, I'm not a giant fan of that approach because it's not particularly sustainable. And unless you have a reason to make really big structures, I, I try and avoid it. Uh, I know Professor Gobin's work with Mike Sefton when she was in Toronto was to make little tissues, microscale tissues, and then pack those together. And if you pack microscale tissues together, there's lots of holes bet between them. You can feed them that way. Uh, when you showed, um, like, it was really interesting to see the difference between the normal cells and the fibroblastic cells. Can you can you tell us, like, what was like, what were the fibroblastic cells? Like, how do you get those? Like, yeah, and is that potentially, you know, does it affect what you find or? Uh, potentially. So those were human patient derived cells. So we got those from uh, human patients who had, who uh, from normal lung sections versus uh, those who had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and fairly advanced idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis too. Uh, when cells undergo that fibrosis transition, they start to express alpha spin muscle actin and that alpha spin muscle actin is expressed in the uh, actin cytoskeletal filaments. We know that those drive the pulling power of the cells. And so the cells that we were using came from patients but had been characterized to show that very strong alpha spin muscle actin pulling expression. Does that answer your question? Or is that yeah. Okay? Yeah. Hi, Chris. It's a really nice talk. And uh, you talked uh, several times about uh, it's hard to control the cell shape. Would that be possible to use, uh, a, you know, new technology, really confine a cell, because the cell at 10 micron? Because your cells at a 10 micron scale, it wouldn't be harder to confine them into 10 micrometers. No, you should be able to. Uh, so are you talking about doing the same? So we've been building all of our stuff to be fairly, uh, not fairly large, but I guess large by, by the length scale of, of microns, right? Um, are you talking about looking at patterning individual cells? Yeah, because you showed uh, those cells once you drop into the hydrogel uh, patterned uh, those uh, pocket, and uh, they that enable that they all become spherical because they they really grab each other. So you, I think, or I didn't get it, your idea correctly. You mentioned it's hard to control the cell cell shape or tissue shape. Uh, using conventional techniques, yes. But using that, the method that I talked about, about making the little pockets, yeah. if we can make the pocket a certain shape, yeah. right, then the cells should grow up to fill that shape. Yeah, I thought that there would be, be multiple technologies we could use to generate a kind of a mechanical shape, let the cell go in there, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the way that we're trying to explore that now is we, we this happened yesterday. We took delivery on a wax 3D printer that allows us to print at six micron resolution. So with a little bit of luck, we'll be able to make structures that have these six micron scale patterns on them. Uh, and then if you can do it in wax, then you can use the lost wax method to replace that wax mold with a metal mold. And then our metal mold should be okay to, to engineer these hydrogel type of structures. It is challenging though, because anytime you replicate in a soft material, if that soft material squishes and deforms or swells, you lose a lot of that structure. So I'm not sure what's going to happen, but it's certainly on our certainly on our agenda to try. Yeah, just following this, another question is uh, how important because those of the cells even into the hydrogel pattern pocket, uh, look at them. It's, it's a lot. So the the bar scale that was 200 micron by the ball, the spherical shape is about a one millimeter. And how important to handle the one individual cell in terms of a tissue engineering perspective? Um, it's a really good question. Um, one of the things I appreciate about biology is how resilient it is, right? Uh, when a single cancer cell is introduced into many cell culture environments, that single cancer cell is quickly targeted and killed, right? It takes, a, it takes time before that single cancer cell takes a hold in the environment and continues to develop and grow. So I think, it, I think a lot depends on your question, right? If your question is trying to figure out how a single cell might interact in this situation, then it would make sense to build those technologies. Uh, but if you're interested in building the disease model in the first place, uh, 
well, then I, I, don't, I don't know if it makes sense to start out from a single cell. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? No, we're good? Well, then uh, let's uh, join me to thank Professor Christopher Morris to uh, speak to everyone at Waterloo. And then uh, on this note, thank you.